All right, good afternoon and welcome to our South Carolina Ag Disruptors webinar series. I'm Kevin Burkett with Clemson Extension Agribusiness and this is our, I believe, fourth program in the series, which is a series that uh, where we're going to touch on topics related to South Carolina agriculture and possible disruptors to some of the things that happened in the state, both potentially good and potentially bad. And so each monthly topic will change, but want to bring up some things that could be of importance and could have a significant effect on the state's producer. So again, I think we've had four programs so far and some of those are uploaded to YouTube and we'll probably continue to do that as well in case you miss a topic or would like to go back and catch up on some of those. But we're scheduled from 12 to one. And for today's program, we have Dr. Corey Heaton, who is a extension wildlife specialist and he's going to touch on uh, nuisance wildlife as it relates to farms and agriculture. And then following that, we'll have Dr. Steve Richards, who is also an agribusiness associate, and he's gonna to touch on different business ideas and kind of evaluating those for feasibility and that sort of thing. And so I think today was gonna to touch on aquaponics and evaluating that. So uh, just real quick, before we get started, that we've done this in the past, but we'll just ask a quick poll question it says, uh, what is your level of knowledge on nuisance wildlife management and agriculture? So you can go ahead and indicate before we start today's program, kind of what your level of knowledge is. And then at the end, we'll kind of ask a similar question. But thanks for joining us for today. I'll give people a moment to respond to the poll. And then I'm going to turn it over to Corey. You can kind of submit comments or questions in the chat and we'll try to follow up on those at uh, probably maybe the end of the presentation. So we'll have 30 or 40 minutes for this first presentation then we'll turn it over to Steve. But it looks like everybody's responded. So I'm going to turn it over to Corey. Go ahead and share the screen. Good afternoon. We have a uh, lot of information to cover in a short amount of time, but I'm going to do my best to hit the high points and uh, make sure y'all get the information you need when looking at this. There are so many different wildlife impacts that we could look at uh, as it pertains to agriculture, but for the sake of today's talk, I'm going to focus on the two big ones that's on everybody's mind, and that's deer and wild hogs. Uh, but I'm going to go through some of that with you. But you're, you're welcome to email me with any questions you have about other wildlife impacts. I know birds cause a lot of problems for folks as well. Geese are a big issue for a lot of folks, but regardless, we're gonna cover deer and hogs today. And if you have questions about other things, feel free to contact me. So just jumping right in, we'll start out with hogs. And basically the, the distribution of hogs has looked fairly similar for the past 20 years. Um, you know, the coastal plain of South Carolina has had hogs since white man got here you know they've, they've been here forever we brought them on the first ships that came from europe most of those stayed confined to the coastal plain uh, for several centuries as they became more and more popular as game species you started seeing them moving around the state um, with help from humans and now what you see is is a lot of concentrations along the, the river basins which is predominantly where they stay you do some of the see some of these red spots that indicate populations that are outside of river drainages those are most definitely areas where people have moved them and they have become established. So that's been a big issue for us in this state. And we have made some changes in laws to hopefully address that issue moving forward in the future. Um, but they are present in all 46 counties at this point. I hear a lot about the hog population exploding in South Carolina. And while I understand why people might think that, it's not actually what has happened. Um, this is the population estimates for South Carolina from 2002 to 2019. And if you look at that line, what you'll see is that the population, according to the data that's been collected, has not actually exploded. You have seen with storms and other things, hogs showing up in areas where you may not have seen them in the past. And you've also seen issues where people have moved hogs to areas where they weren't in the past. So, I understand why people may think those populations have exploded, but the numbers have remained fairly consistent. So for the past 20 years, we're averaging somewhere in that 135 to 150,000 animals. 
Um, and it's been pretty consistent at that mark. So no, unfortunately, for those who like to paint doom and gloom, the population isn't exploding. Um, but that doesn't mean anything because the current population causes a significant amount of damage every year. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that more as we move forward. Interestingly, uh, the Department of Natural Resources does a pretty good job of surveying hunters and landowners every year and, and developing estimates on what's happening with deer and hogs and turkeys and other things. But for the sake of hogs, um, what the studies have shown over the past 20 years, deer hunters, just normal hunting practices, they're going to harvest around 30,000 pigs, give or take, every year in this state, which represents about 20 percent of that population. Uh, and, and that's going to be an important number to remember as we move forward in this talk. But as it sits right now, the 20 year average, we're somewhere around 20 percent of our hog population is removed each year by deer hunters. Those numbers don't include the hogs that were trapped. Um, they don't include numbers from the folks who hunt them with dogs. Uh, so this is just the numbers uh, taken during standard deer hunts, um, you know, basically as a as a bycatch, if you will. Um, but a significant number, 30,000 each year. And if the population was exploding, you would see that number going up each year um, because the encounters would go up. That's not really what we've seen. What you see is a slight fluctuation from year to year. And if you go back and look at that population map, it, it mimics exactly what I was telling you. The years that we appear to have more hogs, the hunter harvest is higher. The years that we're slightly below that average, the hunter harvest is slightly lower as well. Uh, so those do track together as you move through. So I told you that 20% was interesting because pigs are a lot different than any other species of wildlife we're actively managing in the South. It is very difficult to reduce a wild pig population in a good quality environment. You know, if they have all the habitat requirements that they need, it is a difficult animal to get under control. And Texas, of course, been battling this at a much higher level than we have for about the same amount of time, maybe a little longer. Um, but one of the things that that they did recently was put this publication out where they did some modeling exercises to look at what happens to wild pig populations in the presence or absence of harvest and then at different levels of harvest over any given year. So basically what this model does is let's just say they're starting out with 2.6 million pigs. And if you look at that third column, that's the annual population harvest rate. So if we start out with 2.6 million pigs and we don't do anything to harvest those numbers, at the end of five years, that population is over eight and a half million. So your, your population increased 3.33 times, uh, which is a huge increase in population. What if we harvested 15% of that 2.6 million? Well, your population over five years is gonna climb to six and a half million from 2.6, and that's an increase of two and a half times. So at 15%, you're still, 15% harvest, you're still seeing significant population growth. What about at 28% harvest? We still saw that population more than double. So it went from 2.6 million to 5.2 million. And in South Carolina, you know, looking at the data, we're harvesting about 20%. So we're somewhere in between that 15% and that 28% that you would see on this figure. So our population should be growing somewhere between two and two and a quarter times every year uh, or every five years. And that's not what we're seeing. That's not what we're seeing at all. Um, but interestingly, if we bump that harvest up to 40%, we're still going to take that population from 2.6 million to 4.2 million. So there's still going to be significant growth over that five year period. In order to stop, based on these models out of Texas, in order to stop population growth, and that's not to reduce the population, that's just to make sure that it didn't get any larger than it was, they had to harvest a minimum of 66% of those hogs just to keep the numbers where they were each year over a five year period. Some of the other studies that are out in the literature, you know, you're, you're looking at 65 to 80% of that herd has to be removed every single year just to keep the population stable, as in not growing, but not decreasing either. That's a big task to harvest 80% of the pigs that are in any given area. It's dang near impossible. Uh, so that is a big situation for us. But if you look at South Carolina where we're only harvesting 20% of that herd every year by the deer hunters, but our population isn't growing, you have to start thinking about where those pigs are going and, and what's happening to those pigs. And hopefully I can show you that in the next few slides. 
So there are a lot of things that play into what happens with a wildlife population. Uh, carry capacity is a big issue. How many animals can that particular habitat support? And I think that plays a role for us in South Carolina. Some other things, predation. You know, what are the coyotes doing to the pig population? What are the birds of prey doing to the population, especially owls? Uh, what are alligators doing um, from the coastal plain down? Uh, so that there are uh, scenarios where predators are actually helping us out with the pig population. Diseases, there are abundance of diseases in wild pigs, but at this point, I'm not sure how big of an impact they're actually playing in limiting that population's growth. Resources on good years, we see populations tend to do better when there's a bumper crop of acorns and we've had an exceptional growing season like last summer when we had sufficient rainfall throughout the state. You can see those populations respond to that, uh, but it takes a longer term to really see that impact. Uh, hunting, there's lots of different types of hunting that go on, even though we're only really reporting one with these figures. So hunting can play a big role in that. And weather, you know, a lot of us don't want to think about this, but Nobody likes a hurricane except for the guy who's trying to manage a property that's infested with hogs. And if you look at the population trends, we, we probably were saved from pretty serious expansion of this hog population from the 2015 to 2020 time period because of all the big rain events and major storms that caused flooding. And we lost a significant number of pigs throughout this state and North Carolina from flooding incidents. Um, a lot, you know, right here in Columbia, the Congaree pig population, it plummeted after that flood in 2015. Uh, and then as it was trying to bounce back, we had continued flooding in 2016 with all those storms listed on the right. 2017, we had more hurricanes. 2019, we had more hurricanes. 2020, we had more tropical storms and hurricanes. So there's a lot of major rain events that led to some flooding issues. And if you look at that map, the pigs predominantly reside in those river valleys, those river floodplains. So when we put all of those underwater, the pigs that didn't leave the area and move to higher ground were washed out to sea. You know, we just lost that percentage of the population. And as cruel as that may sound to some folks, that's probably the best thing that could have possibly happened to us. Uh, and it has really done a good job of helping limit how much that, that population grew. So I, I keep going back to we're only reporting the the ones harvested by deer hunters. And the reason I'm doing that is there's plenty of studies out there where they're looking at different hog programs to remove hogs from the landscape. And overwhelmingly, the biggest number of hogs that come off the landscape every year come from trapping. Uh, and then this, you know, figure that I modified from some data out of Texas, they were only actually removing 11% of that annual harvest through hunting, uh, where we're actually removing uh, 20, 20 plus percent each year through regular hunting. Uh, but trapping makes up a big number of the hogs removed in this state, just like it does in Texas. So that's not in that figure. Um, and I'm telling you all this because I think with weather, with different types of hunting and, and some other factors that go into play here, like flooding, I think we are effectively over the past 20 years, keeping that 80% or 66 to 80% of that population in check each year through our activities and through through natural occurrences like flooding. And that has bought us some time where this population didn't actually explode. Uh, so not that I want to tell any of you to pray for a hurricane, but we need to keep those things coming or we can wind up in worse shape than we are. It's not really hard to keep pigs out of crops, but it is uh, to some folks uh, financially limiting. Uh, it's a lot easier to keep pigs out of a crop than it is a deer or birds. Uh, real simple electric fences like the one you're looking at there, 90 plus percent effective at keeping pigs out. They do not like electricity and you don't have to construct a real tall or elaborate fence like you would for a, a white tailed deer. Two strands of electric wire, one six to eight inches off the ground and one 12 to 14 inches off the ground and you're going to keep pigs out of that crop. We've done it on our research centers where we have pigs. It's very effective. The times that it fails when we get too dry for the ground rods to work, and when one of the farm workers forgets to close the gate because those pigs will walk the edge of that fence and you'll be able to see it they turn it into a highway when that that corn hits that doe stage those pigs are going to walk the perimeter of that fence all night long trying to figure out how to get into it but we can keep them out of it with a simple fence like this some of the livestock guys have a lot of trouble with pigs uh, getting into pastures and hay fields making a mess and for most of our livestock guys 
the addition of one strand of wire to their current fence setups will stop that problem on the pasture side. Uh, we space our wires out a little differently for keeping cattle in than we would for keeping pigs out. So going below your bottom strand with an additional strand about six inches above the ground should take care of that problem for you. Clemson has done some studies uh, looking at, at wild pig damage on ag crops. Uh, Dr. Sherry Rodriguez in the forestry department put a study together several years ago where she mailed out surveys to 2,500 farmers uh, and Farm Bureau members across the state. And, and they basically reported what they perceived as the damage on their farms. And so out of 2,500 surveys, she got 750 responses back, which may not sound like a lot, but that's still 30% of the people she surveyed that responded, which is definitely sufficient for doing this type of work. Um, and, and what she put together, while those numbers are perception versus actual numbers, it does give you an idea of what's going on out there. And it provides a sound basis uh, you know, for conversations like this. But but what she found uh, in these survey reports was about a $44 million perceived loss uh, to crops and livestock operations across South Carolina. Uh, she also noted that there was another $71 million loss uh, to wildlife food plot situations, to streams, to ponds, wetlands, and a lot of different other environmental factors there. Uh, so. Total, you know, you were looking well in excess of a hundred million dollar loss each year to wild pigs in South Carolina. Um, and one of the things that Dr. Rodriguez pointed out in her study was, you know, putting together an actual comprehensive study that, that put some definitive numbers behind this damage. And like I said, I think the study that she did provides good sound information for us as a basis to get started moving forward uh, with putting that actual on the ground information together. But for right now, this is what we have to work with on hogs. So we're looking at somewhere around 44 million to crop damage in South Carolina right now. From 150,000 pigs, that's significant. 150,000 pigs causing, you know, 44, $45 million in crop damage. Look at what each pig's costing us. So the damage, you know, there's all different levels of damage with pigs, you know, right now, I have folks who are telling me that they're not noticing any pig damage until they crank that combine up and then they notice that the pigs didn't root through the wheat fields. They actually went through and stripped the wheat out of the heads. That's a big thing this time of year. They get in there and they browse the heads off of small grains. So you don't notice the ground disturbance and you may or may not notice those seed head disturbances until you actually start looking at the numbers coming through that harvester. The big issue for us, though, is at planting time uh, and corn and peanuts seem to be the, the ones that, that catch the most trouble from pigs. But it's interesting. Pigs have an exceptional, exceptional sense of smell better than any other animal I know, and they can root across an entire field and never leave the furrow. So you come across that field and plant corn and they literally go down the furrow and they're picking up every single kernel of corn that you planted. And that's what this picture is showing you here. If you look through there, you can see they have been down every single row in that field and they haven't missed that furrow one time. You don't see any rooting in the tire tracks or in between rows. It is all strategically placed in the furrows. So they're very efficient at what they do. And this is another corn issue that we see a lot with wild pigs. Um, and you don't notice this one nine times out of 10 until you actually get on that harvester to go out there and get that corn up. They don't necessarily do this on the edges of the fields. They like to walk out a couple hundred yards into the field where you can't see it from the truck. And then they make these crop circle like events happen where they go out and root up all the corn, knock down all the corn and eat all of it. They feel protected out there in the middle of that corn field. They've got good cover all around them and they can feed out there all night. And as they make it through, uh, you know, that doe stage, they can really cause some serious impacts in those fields, huge losses in some areas. So that's a big deal for us. And again, if you're a corn grower, you're going to have to give up and you got pigs, you're going to have to give up on this scouting corn from the truck. You're going to actually have to get out there and start walking these fields to see where the damage is at and see where you need to be working on exclusion. Now let's switch gears and talk about deer a little bit. Um, I've done a lot more work with deer than I have pigs scientifically, but we have a study going right now. We started it last year, but we're looking at the economic impact of deer on soybeans in South Carolina. We've also uh, started some projects to look at the same thing in peanuts and cotton. Uh, but these group of uh, folks here, we've been working for several years now trying to get a good number 
uh, of what the deer herd is costing us in this state, especially our soybean growers. You know, ultimately, like I said, what we want to know is how much these deer are costing us. And that's important because we need to know how much we can afford to spend to prevent that deer damage. You know, we, we don't want to be telling people how to control deer numbers if it's costing them more than the deer we're actually causing in damage, because then we're, we're putting the farmer even further in the hole, and that's not what we're looking for. Uh, so we're trying to develop the data set that we need to get those numbers on what the deer are actually doing in our soybean crops. Uh, and we're trying to come up with those thresholds for when we need to start putting uh, damage prevention controls in play. So part of the study that we're doing right now is trying to get a grasp on how many deer are actually out there. Uh, and, and the Department of Natural Resources, and I'll show you their data in a little bit, the Department of Natural Resources releases their deer estimates. Their deer estimates come from a deer hunter survey that's mailed out at the end of the year. And it provides solid data if you were looking at, at developing trends or something, but it, it's not site specific and it, it is not based off of an actual field survey that measured or accounted deer. Uh, not knocking what they're doing, I understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. But when we start talking about fine tooth stuff with uh, economics, it's very important that we know exactly how many deer are out there so we can figure out how much each one of those deer are costing us. Uh, so we've done this study in quite a few areas. We've tried to stay pretty heavy into our big soybean counties. Uh, we, we have projects going right now in Barnwell County, Orangeburg County, Florence County, uh, Anderson County somewhere else I can't remember off the top of my head but we go out and we do actual deer spotlight surveys three nights and take the average of those three nights how many deer we saw on that particular route the figure on the right shows you three routes in Barnwell County we try to lay these routes out so that we're not just riding through row crop fields counting all the deer concentrated in the field I'm trying to do a good job of surveying that area so I'm covering wooded areas residential areas and uh, those ag areas to give me a good idea of what that population actually looks like at each individual site. And so what we saw in, in the figure on the right, that's, that's one of the sections in Barnwell County. And this, this represents the three routes that you can see on the left, plus an additional route that's slightly below them. And what we found, uh, the three night average for those routes ranged from 128 deer per square mile to 278 deer per square mile. That's huge. That's huge. That's a lot of deer per square mile, a lot of mouths to feed. And it's a very expensive uh, species of wildlife. I'll show you that in a minute. But some serious damage can be done when we start reaching population levels above 30 deer per square mile. We can start seeing some serious impacts. 30 per square mile. And in this case, we have some approaching 300 per square mile. So some of these areas, agriculture is basically doomed because of deer. The other thing that we did with this, we went in and, and we, after doing survey routes in these areas, we selected soybean fields, cotton fields, and, and some peanut fields in these areas, and we set up exclusion cages so that we could keep the deer out of portions of that field to know how much damage they actually caused. So everything's treated the same across the same field, except we put up a fence to keep them out of small sections of that field. Um, and we tried to do this in a way because deer pressure is not the same across the whole field in most situations. Uh, we tried to anticipate where the pressure would be highest, you know, the furthest away from people, along the wooded edges, uh, those type of areas. But just to be on the safe side, we also set these up in each field and where we would anticipate the damage being the lowest. And then to go along with that, we also have harvest records for the remainder of the field so that we can do a pretty good job of telling you how much uh, that crop could have been had it not been for deer. And it's gonna blow your mind what we saw. Um, so this is an example of one of the exclosure fences that goes up. Uh, it's just a small woven wire fence. We put it around two rows um, and I'll give you a, a rundown. We came back in with a drone and we fly over these fields every week and kind of map the progress of how that crop progresses. Uh, so two weeks after planting, you can see this cage here. Nothing really looks different if you're looking across that field at this point. Uh, a lot of these beans are still just coming out of the ground, so you still got a lot of cotyledon beans out there. That is a serious period for the soybean farmer and for the cotton farmer. When that cotyledon stage plant is out there and those deer browse it, more than likely that plant's done. So you're not gonna see it come back. And that's why you get these real spotty stands in a lot of these fields. 
Um, if they do try to come back and the deer browse them again, it's definitely over at that point. Uh, so you're going to wind up with a lot of holes, uh, a lot of wide gaps in your planting because of deer. But this is going to be interesting. So keep a look at, you see where this cage is now as we progress. So at two weeks after planting, you can't notice a lot of damage. Three weeks after planting, you can notice a significant difference in where we don't have deer. And what's interesting to point out, we never realized how widespread across the field and how evenly distributed across the field the damage actually was. And those deer are actually browsing that entire field. They're not just hitting sections like we thought. Sure, some areas are worse than others, but it's fairly uniform across the majority of that field. So keep that in mind as we progress. This is at three weeks. At four weeks, you can notice a significant difference. Five weeks, it's even more apparent. Six weeks after planting, that's a huge difference. And if I'm a soybean farmer, my goal is to get that bean up out of the ground, get good vertical growth on that bean. I want those nodes spaced as far as I can get them. The taller that bean is, the better off I'm going to be with stacking it with pods as we move forward. It's also the easier it'll be to harvest. When those deer browse beans really hard, we get what I call football beans, where you have a, a really short, stubby plant and all the beans are, you know, six to 10 inches off the ground. And in a lot of our fields, we're not able to harvest them because they're not tall enough for us to safely maneuver the equipment through. That becomes an issue. At eight weeks, you can still see a significant difference. We almost have full canopy closure at this point. That's important if I'm a grower too. When I get full canopy closure and I have those tall plants with the good spacing between the nodes, I can make sure I'm getting good wind flow through that plant and knock back weed issues because I'm shading them out and I'm getting good wind flow through there to stop some of the potential disease issues, uh, that's important. At 10 weeks, I can still tell a difference from my end on this, uh, and we almost have 100% canopy closure here. So throughout the growing season, those soybeans inside those cages did significantly better than they did outside of those cages. So the deer were having a huge impact. So this is what canopy closure looks like when we plot a, one of these these study fields this is what you're going to see uh, when we have those cages out we do a much better job of closing that canopy faster uh, and we typically have taller beans uh, and you'll see in a minute we have a lot better yield so in some of the fields that we did in barnwell county uh, you'll notice that in every field those cage beans did outperform uh, the checks where they weren't in cages in some situations like the cr example there you had a tremendous difference in yield Overall, for the whole study and every field that was involved in the study, we were right at a 15 bushel difference um, where we had cages versus where we did not have cages. 15 bushels is big. That's big. It's uh, about 25% of the average yield. Uh, so here you're looking at, you know, the yield uh, percentage, soybean damage. And again, what you wind up seeing is that across all these fields throughout the study, about 25% of our crop is lost to deer each year. So what does that mean? If we take the, the numbers presented to us on the deer population level by DNR for Barnwell County, their surveys indicate that we have 15 to 30 deer per square mile. So if we just stick with using their numbers, uh, we take an average of that and it comes out to 22 and a half deer per square mile we're losing 15 bushels per acre is what we identified in our, our trials there. So basically what that's telling us is that for every deer, we're losing 0.67 bushels per acre. For every deer per square mile, we're losing 0.67 bushels per acre. At 15 to 30, that doesn't sound too bad. Uh, but in some of our study work that we looked at, you know, we were at 130 to 300 deer per square mile. And just to tell you the, the, the percentages there, uh, if, if I had 100 deer per square mile, I'm expecting to lose 67 bushels per acre. If I had 125, that's 84 bushels per acre. If I had 150, I'm losing 100 bushels per acre. We don't have soy green bean growers in this state consistently producing 80 and 100 bushel beans. So if the deer population's there, there's no chance they'll ever do it. And we've seen that in some of these, these better fields where we had cages with high deer densities. So if you start looking at the DNR numbers on this, um, they're ranging somewhere between 10 and 50 deer per square mile based on their surveys that they mail out. 
in the studies that we have going now, you know, our, our numbers in that soybean belt where we're growing a lot of beans are, are consistently staying above 100 deer per square mile. So we're, we're three to four times higher uh, actual deer numbers than what those surveys are showing us. And that can be big moving forward. But if we take into account deer numbers and what we saw in the studies in 2020, so if we look at the statewide production of soybeans in 2020 with what our deer estimates were in 2020 and what we concluded the damage was in actual fields by excluding deer out of them. In 2020, we lost 7 million bushels and just assuming that it was $10 a bushel in 2020, that's a $70 million loss just in that one crop. That's huge, that's huge. And you gotta figure too, the same or similar damage is occurring in cotton, it's occurring in peanuts. The damage is different, but it's still causing a pretty significant impact. We've done a lot of work with deer over the past five years, six years, looking at ways to keep them out of crops. We've looked at, at this point, I think, with the exception of one or two, we've looked at every commercial deer repellent that's out there. We've tested a lot of chemicals that farmers felt like were working. Uh, some of the things they put down for fungicide, some of the things they put down for insect control. Um, we've tested all those things and looked at them. At the end of the day, you know, we found quite a few things that are effective. Um, one of the most cost effective methods of keeping deer out of a crop that we've found so far is insecticidal soap. Um, works very well, does a good job. If you look on that graph on the left, it's kind of in the middle there, um, but you can see the damage ratings very low in those crops that were treated with insecticidal soap. Um, at plant options, we have some options that can go in furrow. You know, we didn't used to have deer issues in cotton when I was growing up but we put Timic in the ground on every acre of cotton we had to keep the thrips out of them. Uh, well, when Timic disappeared, a lot of farmers got out of the habit of putting out of carb in the ground when it came back. Not so much that they got out of it, it, it outpriced itself and availability limited our ability to put it out on every acre. But when I was a kid, deer didn't damage cotton and that's one of the biggest differences. We didn't, we used out of carb back then. Uh, so we put out of carb into trials and what we saw is for six weeks after that application, unless we had significant rainfall, Aldicarb did a very good job of keeping deer out of soybeans. Uh, we looked at some other stuff, 4 8 one that I'd heard from quite a few people like Thymet. Uh, it actually had the exact opposite effect. Where we put Thymet out in soybeans, we had more damage uh, than the control. But Aldicarb in furrow worked very well for us. Insecticidal soaps or soap-based repellents worked very well for us on the foliar side. But the big question is, you know, I'm getting six weeks of control out of out of carb. I'm getting about 10 to 14 days of control out of these foliar repellents. How many times can I afford to go across that field and put these products out to keep the deer out? And, you know, I still don't have a definitive answer for you on that. We're working on that right now, um, but we've got to get that number together. And again, we are moving that direction now. And with that, if y'all can send me any questions you have, heaton2 at clemson.edu, I'll uh, do my best to get those answered for you. And thank you for having me today. Yeah, we do want to thank Corey for being on with us. I think that's a topic that we hear about a decent amount from farmers. And so hearing about some of those studies and getting some context and some uh, information related to the damage in the state, I think is, uh, it's interesting to learn about certainly and something we want to help farmers with. So in that regard, I would say if you've got further questions, like you said, reach out to Corey, maybe be on the lookout for some studies and programs uh, that they, they might be doing in relation to wildlife management. Uh, so real quickly, uh, before we transition to Steve, we'll just ask a quick poll question and uh, just says, what is your level of knowledge on nuisance wildlife following uh, our presentation there? And so then I'll let, uh, I'll let Steve load up and share his screen and get ready for our second talk for today. Thanks, Kevin. I thought that was a good presentation from Dr. Heaton. Close the poll here. So um, 
every week I was, or every month, I was hoping to do an ag disruptors or not, pick a technology, something new, something maybe not so new and say, hey, is this a disruptor? Like in a good way, is this going to change the way we farm uh, in general? And so this presentation is aquaponics. And a lot of times why I get do these presentations too is to answer a lot of questions that might be out there. So what is aquaponics? It basically combines aquaculture with hydroponics. Both of these technologies actually were disruptive. Think about raising seafood. Most of our seafood now comes from farming. It comes from aquaculture operations. And hydroponics in its day or indoor agriculture was very revolutionary for high value crops, uh, things like tomatoes, herbs, things like that. So the idea is we're going to combine these two disruptive technologies and make a super disruptor. Uh, so the affluent from the fish, effluent, is going to be digested by bacteria. This will be cycled through a closed system. It'll fertilize the plants and we'll have both fish, aquaculture, uh, or any kind of seafood, aquaculture products and uh, hydroponic products. The systems themselves can be as simple as two parts or a complex system of many components or species. Now, what does it produce? Basically, we, in the systems in general, they produce low to medium uh, nutrient requirement type products. Uh, this is the plant side, lettuces, herbs, cabbage. Uh, and then the fish, there can be many different types of fish, but tilapia tend to be the fish used because they can handle more crowding and they can also handle changing water environments, which is part of the system. So those nitrate levels, ammonia levels, uh, things like that, uh, tend to uh, vary quite a bit as the crop grows. So just a brief introduction. I try to keep these to five, 10 minutes. Let's score this aquaponics idea. Is it an agricultural disruptor? So four categories. Again, if you missed last week, technical, marketing, financial, economic, and management staffing. Technical ranking. Is this technology reliable? And some of the questions I typically ask are, just because it can grow here, should it be grown here? And that's usually an outdoor product. Well, this is an indoor product, typically. So being inside ag, the technology will probably work in South Carolina without a problem. How widely adopted, there's how-to manuals out there, there's consultants, things like that. Is it a new idea? Yes. Is it somewhat revolutionary idea? Yes. Regulatory environment? Not much, so we don't see any barriers there, but I'm going to give the technical ranking a four because although it has been proven and it has been adopted, it's still quite difficult for folks to actually manage the science behind it. And I have a few more slides on that later. What about marketing? Marketing ranking of the products. Well, as you can see that there are some high value products that can be grown with aquaponics, especially the herbs, uh, lettuces, things like that, microgreens even. Uh, that market's proven, so we don't have to say that that's gonna get a low score. But the fish itself, the fish, tilapia especially, that market exists, but it's the lowest value fish in the seafood cabinet, typically. Uh, and how do you differentiate that product? You can differentiate your plants perhaps by like it's grown this way, hydroponically, et cetera, et cetera, indoors, no sprays. But tilapia, how, you know, you're competing with other farm tilapia. The differentiation cannot be that I grew mine in a 55 gallon drum where the others grew in a pond. Uh, very difficult and very hard to sell that product. So marketing gets a four. Economic and financial, well, what's the potential to make money on this? And I always say just because something's a good thing to do or something that somebody believes in doesn't mean it's necessarily a good business idea. Think about the audiences that this product was geared towards. It wasn't geared towards production, agriculture, and farmers. It was geared towards homeowners and homesteaders who had the idea that they want to be self-sufficient. And so they might not have known necessarily what they're getting into. And the economic and financial downfall of this technology tended to be the third bullet point there, 
the selling package for these are where you're going to get 100% yield every time and you can sell every product you have for 100% retail price. Most people found that they don't get 100% yield and farmers know this. Uh, think about Dr. Heaton's presentation. Uh, of course, indoor ag, you don't have deer and hogs and things like that, but 100% yield every year is very hard to achieve. And even more so, 100% retail price. You're going to harvest all of that and sell all of that. No spoilage, no waste. The buyer wants everything you have. Rarely happens in real life. And finally, economically, is this technology scalable, easily scalable? No, it's not. So economic and financial gets a three for those reasons. Finally, management and staffing. Um, does this business rely on skilled management? Yes, it does. Is this technology easy to implement? What's interesting about this technology, and I, I liken it to uh, making wine, that's a lot of chemistry involved, uh, and I managed a winery once. Basically, the larger volume systems or the larger volumes you're dealing with, the more forgiveness you have. So sometimes you have a smaller volume of water, those nitrate balances, those ammonia balances, things like that, that you have to test for every day in these systems can get way out of whack before you know it, your fish, is, fish are all dead and you have to start over. Also the inputs, uh, this should have been the economic part, sometimes are hard to find. And in terms of training staff to take over for the owner who took how many classes to learn this is also difficult. So based on the difficulty of managing this technology, I give that a three as well. So to sum up, and this is the scorecard that we talked about last month, where does this fall? It's be a 14 out of 20. Uh, you have an average chance of success, which average chance of success, 60% of most new businesses fail. So you're kind of right in the middle, right in the middle. So is this a disruptor? No, it's not a disruptor. But if somebody were to say, hey, how can I modify my business plan to make it better? So you have to think about these hurdles that this technology uh, is preventing it from being taking off, being widespread, being a disruptor. Costly to set up and maintain. That would be the technological downfall. So how can you do it a little bit cheaper? Management. How are you going to be able to manage these things like water testing, water chemistry, plant nutrition, fish nutrition, and, and all that, and, and constantly monitor it? Maybe it's more technology. Financial. They found that these systems take a lot of electricity, uh, water pumps, growing lights, especially if the whole system's inside. Keeping water temperature at 85 degrees or whatever temperature that aquatic species needs to grow. Um, and economically, it's not easily or inexpensively scalable. So if I wanted to double my operation, it's not like um, take a dairy barn, for example, I want to add 20, 200 cows on my 200 cow barn, well, I can double the size of my barn, I don't have to have a new barn. But some of these technologies like aquaponics, I have to just replicate that same size system over and over and over again. So I'm not saving costs by expanding necessarily or not very easily. And finally, the market for the fish is not robust. So I'm not saying I'm the authority on all these things. And I, I like having discussion. Uh, unfortunately, with the webinar, we can't have too much of a discussion. But do you believe aquaponics is an ag disruptor that is going to change how we farm in the future? Uh, let me know what you think. Next month, I'd like to look at mobile slaughter units. That's a big question out there. Is that an ag disruptor? Will that solve our processing capacity? the issue. Um, if you like other technologies that you're interested in, you want to talk about, look at, feel free to email Scott or uh, Kevin or myself. And thanks. That was the 10 minutes. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And uh, I was going to say just for fun, kind of did have a third poll question here. So based on kind of what you went through and uh, what, what you talked about, uh, maybe what are people's thoughts about aquaponics as a viable business idea. And so you can kind of respond there. Uh, certainly reach out to Steve if you've got more questions or um, would like more information related to um, what he was talking about there. But again, we do want to thank Steve uh, for presenting for us today. And he will continue this series and be looking at other uh, ideas 
as we continue the, the Ag Disruptor webinar series. So uh, with that, uh, we're pretty much done for today. So this program will be the third Wednesday of every month. And so next month will be our July 20th program. And at that point, we'll be looking at carbon markets and Steve will present on another uh, business idea as well. Um, I do see one question through Q&A. I don't know if um, Steve, are you able to see that and or do you want to handle that? Oh, where to find farm raised catfish? Uh, I guess I'd have to research that too, unless somebody else on the call knows. Uh, yeah, it's usually in the Mississippi River Delta uh, where the most catfish farming is. So, so Mississippi would be a good bet. Yeah, Mississippi and Alabama. Free to email me and I see where I can, probably I would look it up on NAS, you know, where the most aquaculture operations are. Yeah. National Ag Statistics Service. Uh, yeah, so um, again, be on the lookout. Uh, if you if you registered for today's webinar, you are registered for the rest of the sessions. And so we are going to be updating the topic list as we line up speakers. And you can even email us of things that you might like to be might like to hear about or things that you might be interested in. And we'll try to line up those topics as well. So next month is July 20th. Again, from 12 to 1, we'll have a uh, speaker on carbon markets. And Steve will look at another business idea and evaluating that. So thanks for joining us for today. And we will end the program now and hope you have a good afternoon.